as we prepare to move in the rest of our service, uh, we, we're going to be doing a, a four-part uh, time today. And they're going to begin to bring you the elements now for communion. And uh, um, there's going to be four parts to this time of ministry. Uh, we collectively will testify through communion. And then the Word's going to testify, and then there's going to be some that are going to testify for us today. But today, as we gather, we come with a testimony of grace. We're calling this time, by this, testimonies of grace. Today, we will testify to what God has done. As you receive those, just hold those there. A few moments, we'll receive it together. And, and as we prepare, uh, the Lord brought me to a most interesting story for this time. Something I, I never dreamed I'd really share from a, a pulpit, but... Uh, uh, anybody ever have one of those cousins who, or aunt, uncles or aunts or friends who, who always uh, tell the same story every holiday? Anybody at all? Okay. As a matter of fact, you can finish the story before they do. I've got, a, I've got a cousin that I love dearly, but they're going to tell you the testimony of how God spared their, their child's life every day major holiday I mean it's relentless and I can finish it you know your first 12 years you're sitting over there going you're mouthing it and then you kind of stop avoiding that person because or start avoiding that person because you just don't want to hear it again and you know when God brought that story to my mind I said Lord what does that have to do with today the fact that she's rehearsing an old miracle that she's still thankful for today we're going to celebrate a miracle that's 2,000 years old a reason to be thankful that's 2,000 years old because I want you to get this I, I, I want to I just want to if I could just be crude for a moment I just want to get down in in your stuff your mess for just a minute there's a whole lot of people that are going what I have to be thankful for during this Thanksgiving season people that are upset about tragedies that are striking our world there is a reason to be concerned you should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem people that are devastated by the outcome of an election people that are that are broken because of the state of their families people that are without jobs I mean even this week I know this name seems silly but with as much catastrophe as going on in the world even I joined in and the sorrow over the loss of Twinkies. Where that came from, I don't know. But there's a whole lot of people trying to decide if they have a reason to be thankful. And my job today is to remind you. To remind you that no matter where you find yourself and no matter what you're going through and no matter what storms have shaken your world, that there's a 2,000-year-old testimony to be thankful for. There's a 2,000-year-old declaration that we've been making and the world may be tired of hearing it, but we need to be like that cousin of mine to say, this was such a great thing I never will forget. I never shall stop. I will always herald the truth that because of grace and what came in Calvary, I have a reason to rejoice and I have something to be thankful for. God in his infinite mercy and his goodness has given us a reason to rejoice. And today, four ways, four ways we're going to testify towards that. The first way we do now collectively, we testify through communion, collectively as a body of Christ. In a few moments, I'll, I'll pray for you and we'll receive the elements then one at a time together. But let's think about that for just a moment. We testify to grace. What we're about to do, God considers very special. You know, I watched in awe as society has grown to where cursing God is just a very acceptable public, not even bleeped out thing on our televisions anymore. And God seems to still reach out in love. To where people curse his very son's name as some byword, and he still sends love. I am ever amazed how God, in his infinite grace and love, he lets us trample the blood of Jesus over and over and over again as we return to that for which he's already forgiven us. 
and he reaches back in love. But there's one particular area about what we're about to do that the scripture says God takes very seriously. The Bible says that some people took communion in an unworthy manner. And because they did not respect the testimony, you see, because what we say and what we're declaring is the hope of the world, a price that was paid. And because they did not respect this testimony of communion, that there are many sick and some have even died. So a God who will let you spit in his face says you will not water down the testimony of Christ. And so he says this, Therefore, let a man examine himself, that he would not receive in an unworthy manner. So now at this time, I want to invite you. Would you bow your heads with me in this place? And by the gift of the Holy Spirit, I tell you today that I've wept through all three of these services because God's presence has been here. God's presence has been strong. But today, I ask you, search your heart. Is there unrepented sin inside of you? Are you so bitter at the person sitting next to you that you can't even pray together anymore? Are you so hurt and you hold that against someone that you can't worship any longer? Is there sin that you're determined to hold on to? Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to turn to Christ. May he forgive you, may he cleanse you, may he deliver you by his grace. The Bible says that as you confess that sin, then he will be faithful and just to forgive you of that sin. Now I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to pray with me also as you ask God to cleanse you. Father God, as I begin to pray for each of these, you see our sin. You see my weaknesses, God, just as you see theirs. Lord, there is no hope but Christ. There is no joy but Christ. There is no way but Christ. And so we come to Christ. Search our hearts, O oh God. Cleanse us. Forgive us by your blood. Change us, Lord, that we might be yours. That we might be completely yours. You see the unforgiveness. You see the bitterness. You see the shame. You see the sin that screams yet even now. But I also hear the cry from the cross that it is finished. Sin's hold is broken. And hope comes to those who love Christ. Father, today as we will testify through the receiving of bread, Father, we thank you for the, the bread that you gave that was representative of your body that you allowed to be broken for us. For we know that we are blessed because you were wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Today, as we prepare to receive the cup, Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that is so absolutely essential to our lives. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you that the body and the blood flowed from Jesus, the greatest gift of heaven, of whom we honor and respect now. Jesus name Amen. as we now have prepared our hearts if you have not please feel free to abstain no one's asking you to be like us but we're inviting you to join us but today the Apostle Paul said that I received this from the Lord that on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed that after dinner he, he took the bread and he, he broke that bread and as he broke that bread he said this is my body, which is broken for you. What he was declaring is you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You can't live perfect. You're not going to be able to make it on your own. You're going to stumble. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to go through, through ups and downs. But this body will give you strength. Just like bread nourishes your body, this body of Christ is where I say, Lord, I can't. And he says, but I can. When I say, Lord, I failed, he says, but I didn't. That this body of Christ is sufficient for you. And so today we celebrate together, remembering the body of Christ. Would you receive the bread today?
after he had eaten, he took the cup. When he had supped himself, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Blood that was shed for us. We remember that new covenant today. Because through his body, we can make it. But through his blood, we begin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no hope. And if you've been playing with Christianity or playing with serving God, look, continue to investigate. There is no condemnation, but I want to be plain. Unless you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and accept the sacrifice of his blood, you are still old covenant. You're still who you were. But when you come to know Jesus, you become a new creature in Christ. And so today, we celebrate. See, when there was a covenant, bread and juice had to be exchanged and blood had to be shed. Jesus brought the bread, he brought the juice, and he shed his own blood. So what that tells me, he has it all covered. I don't know about you, but I rejoice that he has it all covered. You may be seated. And now right there where you are, as they play softly, thank him in your own way. Thank him in your own way. As we collectively together have celebrated and testified together to what Christ has done. Father, thank you thank you for your grace thank you for your goodness thank you for your strength father and all that you have done and all that you will do in jesus name amen we have testified to grace now i really believe that it's important that we hear the testimony of Scripture. In this, by this, these testimonies of grace that we find gratitude, we celebrate today. In the Bible, in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 15, and verse number 5, we've been going through a study in the life of David here in our church, and we're coming to the close of that, and, and probably we'll close next weekend with that topic but as we're coming to the close of the study in the life of David, I thought what a fitting scripture for Thanksgiving Sunday. Because the word of God says, because, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he had commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. What a wonderful Thanksgiving scripture. That David served the Lord all the days of his life and did what was right except in this one way. But remember what we're thankful for today, church. We are thankful for grace. We have come here today to celebrate the most beautiful gift of God to us, the grace that he has extended that says, in spite of where you've been, I still love you you in spite of what you've done in spite of what you even have become i see what you can be says god and i extend my grace to you we celebrate grace now i remember I'm reminded of several years ago someone brought a message here in our congregation it was their very first sermon and when they brought that first sermon it was very much so the one that that you know when you were sitting there you kind of go like this boom 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 thank you may i have another they were, and you're this, and you're a brood of vipers, and you're whitewashed walls, and the congregation's going, ow, ow, ow. And afterwards, somebody said to me, Pastor, that was judgment. And I said, yes, but give them a few years when they've needed grace, and their message will change. A message that can only be born out of true failure yourself. You see, some of you understand what I mean by needing grace. 
Because you've approached that place that where your failure has been so horrible, your pain has been so great that you understand that it seems that hope for, he- uh, for happily ever after has flown out the window. And you can see the handwriting on the wall that it is over for you. But today I come to bring you a a message that all throughout Scripture I saw, but by this, or but by thee, or uh, that, 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 that phrase that tells us this is how it should be, but thanks be to God, this is how it can be. And I declare today that whether or not you see it in your life currently, you have a reason to rejoice, and it's called grace, because grace says your story does not have to end the way it is. Grace, in fact, says that your story doesn't have to have an ending at all. Grace lets us know that in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your story doesn't have to not not only not be a happily ever after, but it can become a happily forever after. You say, Pastor Don, why in light of the resurrection of Christ? Because it was at Calvary that he bought your forgiveness. But it was three days later when all hell tried to hold him back that he burst forth out of that tomb. And when he did, he walked out in victory. His death bought my forgiveness, but his resurrection bought my freedom. Do you understand that? Oh, We miss it sometimes, but I tell you what the Word of God says, that this same Spirit which raised Christ from the dead works in you already, doing something inside of you that we might fulfill the Word of God that says that He is the firstborn of the resurrection. That we don't have to live in sin, and we don't have to live a million miles away from God trying to hide all of our failures. Let me just show you what the Lord just pops in my heart. And we don't have to sit here and pray that he doesn't notice what we've been up to. Because he does notice, he does see, but because of the resurrection, we can step forth in life and say, I have went to the cross, and at the cross I repented, but now on resurrection morning, I will not be bound by sin anymore, but I will become what God's grace has given me the right to. A reason to rejoice, a reason to celebrate. You see, this is important because whether you know it or not, you are going to be classified either by your failure or God's grace. It's going to happen, you know. (laughs) You ever walk up to somebody and you see them whisper before you get there? You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Somebody said to me, we ran into somebody, and they said to me, they said, my goodness, they, they've gotten big. And I said, uh, <laughs> yeah, but the problem is they're saying the same thing about me as I walked away. <laughs> my goodness, he's gotten big. Because people are going to give their opinion. People are going to judge you. People are going to know you for your failures because we think we do these things in secret, but they have a way of being heralded out across our communities. You will either be classified by your failure or you'll be classified by the fact that you may have failed but you stumbled into God's house, whether or not, I mean, I know people who feel this way. They're like, I don't know if they let me in there by accident or not, but I sure am glad they let me in. And now it's their mistake because I cried out to God, he's my father, it's his house, now I'm welcome. Amen. Whether you got here by the skin of your teeth or not, we all find the same ground. If you march through the door or you drug yourself through the door, grace says we don't deserve it, but grace says we can have his love and his grace and his power, and we don't have to be classified by failure. But here's the thing. It's your choice. It's your choice whether or not you'll be classified by your failure or your struggle. See, now in the Bible, and here we see it in this passage of Scripture, There's only one of two classifications. We saw it because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Followed his commands all the days of his life. And then uh, if we look over a few pages at another king or another leader, another person who says they did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. See, there wasn't a in-between. They didn't say, well, they kind of did right kind of did wrong it's either right or wrong it's one or the other there's no in between now my brother's been picking on me about going over the 40 mark you know 
But I feel like it qualifies me to make this next statement. You see, sometimes we qualify our lives by decade. Some of you hadn't had enough decades to know what I'm talking about. Some of us, you know what I'm talking about. For this decade, I served God. And for this decade, I didn't. This decade, I was really involved. And this decade, you know, my world was falling apart. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You see, we judge our lives by this up and down faith. And that's not the way God judges us. God's not going to look at us and say, well, you got it right most of the time. It's either right or wrong. And see, that leaves some of us on the outs. Because in this passage of Scripture, it says a very interesting thing. It says, David did what was right. But if you've been here at all in the last few weeks, let me just catch those of you up to speak. David messed up majorly. David sinned big time. David did things he couldn't undo. But the Bible says, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed his commands all, say that with me, all the days of his life. Except, that's where grace comes in. Except. In the, in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And here he failed. But he still did what was right in the eyes of God. And the except is where grace cries out to us. In the exception to the rule, therein we find grace. In the exception to the rule, therein we find hope. Ex except in this matter. Now, I've got to tell you, but I'm kind of glad I don't live in the scriptural days because I don't feel like that's the way mine would read. I feel like mine would go, and Don did what was right in the eyes of the Lord except in the matter of blank, 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 comma, 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 comma. <laughs> don't laugh too loud. Yours might be longer. <laughs> Some of us see this one line and we think, oh, but we may have written a thesis. An exception. But listen to me. What we're crying, what we're saying to you today, and this scripture is heralding about grace, is that David failed, but he did not allow his failure to dictate the rest of his decade. He did not allow his failure to dictate who he was forever. You see, the except tells me this. That I may have failed, but because of grace, there can be an exception. You see, the problem is when you feel like your failure dictates the rest of your days. But grace says you can serve Christ. And yes, you failed. It doesn't hide your sin. As a matter of fact, it almost celebrates it by the saying, <laughs> it thought it was bad, and it thought it had them, but my grace was sufficient for them. For where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And it makes the exception. And I just want to read to you what I wrote here. For you see, your past sin does not have to be a porter, portal for future failure. And so how, we ask ourselves, as we prepare to conclude this portion, as the Scripture testifies today. How then does this happen? Because of grace. Pastor, how do I invite grace into my life? It's pretty simple. You see, we declared in testimony together through communion. We declare in testimony of the word now. But the Bible says that if you want grace in your life, that you must confess your sins. And we get kind of messed up about that because, you know what, we're, okay, Lord, forgive me my sins today in Jesus' name, amen. But sometimes you've got you to gotta, you gotta lay it out. Are you ready for this? Because I didn't plan on going here, but the Holy Spirit just spoke this in my heart. And sometimes it's not just to God you've got to confess. The Bible says confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Sometimes you've got to say to somebody you trust, really, 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 really trust, I'm weak. And I need your help. I need your strength. Because when we confess, and we're being honest, we're turning from that path of sin 
And we declare that it will no longer define us. That we will no longer be defined by what we've done wrong, but we will be defined by what Christ has done right. And listen to me. Christ's righteousness is your destiny. It's what you were created for. Now, if you're following along with the U version, you'll see there, our last verse here, chapter number 12, verse number 11. And this is how it reads. It says, They won the victory over him because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony we have collectively testified the word has testified but the scripture says they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony now i've studied this this week and in multiple translations this wasn't how it read it said they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the message of the gospel so how do you mix these together? And then I begin to realize that the gospel is not separate from our testimony. Our testimony is because of the gospel. Our testimony is because of Christ. And so today, we celebrate that truth. The truth that says, just like Paul. Paul didn't say, this is who I was, and over here's the gospel. He said this, I was lost. I was everything that a Jew was supposed to be. I was everything that I thought I was supposed to be. But I went about killing people. And I was full of hate. And I was full of anger. And some of you are right there today. Your sin causes you great pain. But then he says, he says, but on a road I saw the light. And when I saw the light, I found a Savior who changed my life. And therein the gospel and his testimony became one. And we miss that. We wonder why we should be thankful. We wonder why we have a reason to rejoice. And I declare to you today that my testimony is just like Paul's. I was lost, but then I saw the light, and now I'm found. But I told you four. We testified. The Word has testified. And now they are going to testify. Celebrate, celebrate with them today.
Awesome power part Awesome and great is your
overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated for just a moment today? Let me just tell you the way that we do things here in this church. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to call you from where you are. But I want every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Don, I want to be able to hold up one of those signs. Because I want God to change my life. And either you, maybe you have never received him or maybe it's a point of rededication. But you say, today, I'm making a testimony. And it's going to come because of what Jesus did for me. Nobody's looking around, everybody praying. Nobody, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. This is not a trick question. But right there, right where you are. If you want to pray that prayer to either rededicate your life or to find Christ for the very first time today. I want you just to hold your hand up as high in the air as you can right there. So I'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Today is your day. Well, God is rejoicing in the heavens. Let's pray this prayer together today. Jesus. Come on, everybody. Jesus. Right now. I believe your word. And today, I accept your sacrifice. Lord, you see my sin. There are many. Forgive me. Cleanse me by the blood of the Lamb. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that from this moment on, all I am, all I ever will be, all I've ever been, belongs to Christ. God is my Father, heaven is my home, Jesus is my Savior, this matter is settled, amen, and amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise today, amen, <laughs> hallelujah, amen. praise God. If you prayed that today, either as a point of rededication or the very first time, we want to encourage you and like to say, if you want, we've got some information out at Grand Central called First Steps. We'd love for you to have some of that today so that you can begin to make that step in the direction of having that positive testimony because now we call you part of our family in Christ. Isn't that awesome? God is so good to us. Amen. Well, the lights are going to come up for just a moment, and, and I told you there were four parts to this, and some of you just thought I was getting slow. We all testified. The Word testified. They did a marvelous job testifying. But now there's a piece of cardboard right in front of you. Reach up and take it. There should be a pen there. There should, on the front row, there's some below you. You might have, there should be. Just reach up and take one. Make sure everybody's got one. And now I want you to make your own. Now, relax. It's too small for you to be show it from here. So you're not going to have to walk around. You're not going to have to move around with this. I have wept all night and day over this. 
As soon as they get through with all theirs tearing me up, people are coming up and going, read mine. I'll be happy to read it if you'd like. But this is you overcoming by the word of your testimony. I can see it now. Some of you might put, I was an alcoholic. And God gave me back my life and my family. Somebody might put, I was a shoplifter. And God has given me everything I need. Somebody, somebody might put, I was broken. And he made me whole. I don't know what you should put, but I know what I have to put. My family was falling apart, you might say, and then he put it back together. This is what I really feel. This is the first time in any of the services I've said this. Some of you, what you say on this side right now will determine what this side looks like in a few days, months, or even years. And what I want you to do when you're done with this is I want you to take it with you. Maybe put it in your vehicle where you'll see it. Put it in your Bible. Put it in your prayer area. See, this is supposed to be the one direction, but I feel the Holy Spirit. Maybe somebody's going to write, my child needs to come home. And you're going to go take this to your prayer area, and you're going to believe for the other side. I've blown it, <laughs> but the wind of his grace blew right back in my direction, amen. Take them on. They're going to play. Make your own now. in your hands now. Take them right there in your hands. Father God, thank you for testimony. Some that are here, their families were broken. They were strung out. But you brought them back together. Some that were here, if they look back, it seems so long ago, they can hardly remember what it was like before your grace. Thank you. And some are here, and they need you to change their situation. Thank you that as they ask, you will. Lord, bless these, your children. And thank you today that four testify in this place. We testify. Your word testifies. They have testified, and now we each one testify that the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Would you say that with me? The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Father, thank you for all you have done and all you're going to do in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise God. God is so good to us. If you're a guest today, please make sure you go back to Grand Central. Before you go, let me give you two very, very, very important uh, announcements. 
One, uh, our, uh, our bilingual service has a desire to build a church in Guatemala. And as a way to, to raise funds for that, as we're going to be putting the roof on this building, it's already an existing congregation. Uh, we are uh, making tamales, and they're selling tamales. And how many of you have ever had an authentic Spanish tamale? Anybody? Amen. I'm going to tell you, the Lord is good. And you can buy those. You don't have to pay for them today. You just need to order them out at Grand Central. They'll make those. They'll be here December the 2nd. Am I right? December 2nd. Uh, they'll be here that Sunday. You don't want to miss those. Um, and then um, this Wednesday night, if you show up at church this Wednesday night, have a good time in the parking lot. And if somebody else shows up, you're the one that's supposed to preach the message. So have one ready. Amen. All right. Hey, man, you have fun. I, want to, I look forward to see you in one of our four cultures next weekend, either Saturday night, Sunday morning, 9, 15, 10, 45, or 12, 30. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't God good?